So we've heard from Catholic leaders from all over the world, from Uganda, from America, from France, from the UK, from Kenya. Now we want to hear also from the legal perspective, much of what has gone on over the last uh, decade and even earlier in the church had to do with abuse, sexual abuse on the part of clergy reaction to it. And while there has been great talk of you know, healing and, and really doing things the right way, let's take the word from an expert. Elizabeth Yor, she's a lawyer from America, she's the founder of Your Children, and she's worked <coughs> with clergy sexual abuse victims, and has seen the devastation, but also seen and recognized what has actually happened with regard to the victims and the perpetrators. It's my great honor to introduce to you Elizabeth Huar. Thank you, John Henry. It's a pleasure to be with you um, here now that we've seen the uh, first session of Woodstock on the Tiber. Um, it is uh, this incessant delivering of visitors, James Martin, Whoopi Goldberg, New Ways Ministry team. Um, we are witnessing a revolution in the church, as Michael said. The subterfuge is for a specific purpose because the documents and discussions are the blueprint for the one world religion, a religion that only listens and only dialogues, a religion with no sin, no purpose, no beliefs, and no Jesus Christ, only the God of the globalist elites. I've been working in clergy sex abuse for 35 years, not only interviewing countless victims, but also providing child protection policies for major dioceses. So it is especially difficult for me to have endured a decade, more than a decade of this pontificate. And this papacy, in my opinion, operates a protection racket for predators. And on March 13th, I, like the rest of the world, watched as Jorge Bergoglio ascended to the Lojo as Francis. I also noticed with disturbing alarm that joining him on the loggia was none other than the most notorious Cardinal Daniels, whose ignominious cover-up of a fellow bishop's sexual predation caused enormous scandal to the church in Europe and to pain to the victim. But with his presence on the loggia may have been incidental, but I don't believe that. He further scandalized the world with his personal papal appointment to the Synod on the family of all places. That was intentional, that was insulting, and that was symptomatic of the future of this Francis papacy. Daniels was the first of many priests, bishops, and cardinals to enjoy the infamous Bergoglio bodyguard. And this synod on synodality in both its underlying document and the final synodal statement speaks interminably of listening and dialoguing with the world. Yet the papacy by its actions has repeatedly insulted and ignored clergy abuse victims who have been personally snubbed and dismissed by Francis. Typically and disturbingly, Francis continues to deal with them as he always does, by imposing his St. Gallen Mafia Omerta of silence. Yet he deploy, deploys his synodal PR machine to churn out hypocritical talking points in hopes of anesthetizing our memory about his own catastrophic record on clergy sex abuse. And even on section 16.4 of the final synodal document, it has the gall to say that the church needs to listen with special care and sensitivity to the voices of the victims of sexual, spiritual, and economic abuse by clergy members. Authentic listening, it says, is a fundamental element of the journey, the journey towards healing, 
repentance, justice, and reconciliation. This prompts the crucial and obvious question, has this pontificate authentically listened with special care to the voices of victims of clergy sex abuse? The answer is a resounding no. And curiously, Francis has a weakness for abusing celebrity priests and bishops and protecting celebrity priests and bishops. They earn a papal privilege and dispensation for consequences, which is absolutely staggering. Let me just mention a few. Ted McCarrick, Father Marco Rudnick, Rupnik, Bishop Zancada, Father Inzoli, Cardinal Cantoni, Cardinal Fernandez, Cardinal Murphy O'Connor. In Francis's world, mercy trumps justice. And despite his endless chatter about the preference for the poor, celebrity transcends integrity. This pattern is shockingly obvious as he has a blind spot for predators who are his friends and famous. Again, the final synodal document talks about opening and listening to those who have suffered abuse. And it goes on to state that addressing the structural conditions that abetted such abuse remains before us and requires concrete gestures of penitence. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the structural condition that abets the cover-up of abuse is Francis himself. After 50 years of studies, reports, scandals, it is demeaning and frankly insulting that the Synodal Fathers peddled this myth of the need to further study the clergy abuse problem. While Francis clearly hears the cry of Mother Earth, he is deaf to the cries of clergy abuse victims. While the purported rising of the oceans tug at his heart, his stone-cold, heartless dismissiveness of abused, consecrated nuns is chilling. We know when he was Bishop of, of Buenos Aires, he told Rabbi Skorka, sexual abuse never happened in his diocese. Well, little has changed in the last nearly 11 years. The Legion of Buenos Aires clergy sex abuse victims assert strongly that Bishop and Cardinal Bergoglio refused to meet with them and did nothing to stem clergy abuse in his diocese. He was busy protecting Father, the popular Father Julio Grassi, the TV star, and in the words of Father Grassi, the predator himself, Bergoglio was holding his hand throughout the criminal trial and appeal. Grassi's conviction for child molestation was upheld and Bergoglio never apologized to the victims, nor did he explain why he funded a secret 400 page unauthorized appeal for Father Grassi following his conviction. Look, the list goes on and on. The human cry of the victims of Chilean father, Karadima, and his protector bishop, Bishop Barros, who witnessed Karadima's abuse. But there's more. The celebrity priest, Father Mercedes Inzoli, who was defrocked by benefit, and in 2014, Francis overruled the sentence of defrocking and instead reduced Inzoli to a life of penance and prayer. And Inzoli was later found guilty by an Italian court of eight counts of sexual abuse of children. Where is the listening and dialoguing with the Inzoli child victims? And under the title of what I can only call resurrecting predators, Francis has made quite a name for himself. Argentine Bishop Zancada who was promoted by Francis as one of his first actions to Bishop of Oran, Argentina in 2013. And despite ongoing complaints from Zangetta by seminarians who were abused by Zangetta, Francis sided with the bishop. And then 
when the doors started closing in on Zagata, he created, Francis created a prestigious position at APSA, even though, even though Zancata was being investigated for financial improprieties in Argentina. Um, and Zancata earned a, a Vatican citizenship. Keep in mind that when the Zancata circus was happening in the Vatican, the McCarrick scandal was also occurring. And the same time, the Vatican Global Summit by the bishops on sex abuse accountability was also occurring. Yet the most infamous, of course, of Francis's protected celebrities is the notorious Cardinal Ted McCarrick, whose status as a serial sexual predator is, was documented extensively in the files of the Vatican, who was suddenly resurrected from sanctions imposed by Benedict. And from 2013, when he was blessed as an envoy to China by Francis, until 2017, for nearly five years, McCarrick traveled globally on behalf of Catholic Relief Services and the USCCB and the Vatican. During this time of his immaculate resurrection by Francis, McCarrick wrote letters to Francis, was given, was allowed to give recommendations for United States bishop appointments, and was thanked profusely by Perelman, Archbishop Eshu, and Francis for his work. And in response to questioning about the allegations of McCarrick, Francis again responded in his classic omerta silence that he knew nothing. And finally, when the walls were closing in, he removed McCarrick from public ministry. Finally, the most recent of all the papal predatory protectees is the celebrity Jesuit Marco Rupnik. And as for the behavior of Pope Francis in this salacious and monstrous scandal, one can only opine, oh, what a tangled web he weaves when first he sets out to deceive. Francis's culpability is indefensible. His complicity is insidious, and his conduct in this scandal is unconscionable. The cry of the victim sisters is ignored by Francis, and their pain is intensified by the personal intervention by Francis to co-op this investigation. Again, the final synodal report says, quote, the abuse of women signals a problem with the exercise of authority and demands decisive and appropriate intervention. Yet the decisive action on Rupnik's insidious abuse was demanded a long time ago, and it's been grossly delayed. Apparently, the only appropriate intervention has been made on behalf of Rupnik by Francis, who is obviously enthralled with this church artist of dark arts. As we know, the Rupnik scandal was dominating the news cycle during the Synod and underscores the hideous hypocrisy, indifference, and cruelty to sex abuse victims. Even though the Jesuits apparently um, recommended uh, that he, would, he is released from all ministry work, the Superior General of the Jesuits disclosed that Rupnik had incurred an automatic excommunication for sacramentally absolving a woman with whom he had sinned against. In March, though, of 2020, Pope Francis approved of Fran Father Rupnik preaching a Lenten homily at the Vatican. Imagine, if you will, what those nun victims felt. In the interim, many victims have stepped forward against Rupnik. A media firestorm of outrage and criticism has been unleashed when it was reported that Rupnik incredibly was placed back into ministry, which underscores the prevailing theme of this papacy when dealing with clerical sex abusers. 
and that is if it bleeds, it leads, and only then will Francis heed. The questions regarding this scandal continue to mul multiply. What role did Francis play in the sudden lifting of the Rupnik excommun excommunication? Did Francis order the initial statute of limitations to be imposed, thus ending criminal charges? At what point did Francis learn of the allegations of Rupnik's predation on the nuns? And when is Francis going to meet with the victim nuns, especially since he enjoyed a very friendly meeting and photo op with Maria Capitella, the current director of Rupnik's Aleti Center? Did Francis have a role in the Diocese of Rome's recent statement praising Rupnik and stating that the center has a healthy community that is free of any serious issues? This scandal highlights the stubborn and mind-boggling refusal of Francis to listen, to dialogue, and protect vulnerable victim nuns, and to ignore the recommendations of the CDF and the Jesuit order, who conducted thorough investigations. Shockingly, the Synod's final document ob obliquely addresses this. The cases of various kinds of consecrated persons, particularly women, signal a problem in the exercise of authority and decisive appropriate actions. It begs the question, did the Senado fathers not understand or appreciate the rank hypocrisy of this statement vis-a-vis -vis the Rupnik case? Where are the outraged voices of the progressive synodal sisters. Why didn't the Francis appointed voting activist synodal nuns demand action and accountability for their fellow consecrated sisters in the faith? And when will Francis exercise his authority and require decisive and appropriate action for the vulnerable and suffering sisters who were the victims. Why doesn't the listening and dialoguing Francis speak out about this tragedy? The rank ne nepotism of Francis drags on as his close Argentine friend, Victor Tucho Fernandez, the man who's in charge of the clergy sex abuse cases, the man who was roundly criticized by Argentines for his handling of, again, a high profile sex abuse case, whose victims were children. He receives the prestigious post as the head of the DDF and the cardinal hat from Francis. Fernandez, Fernandez attempted blatant and obvious misdirection play by blaming clericalism as the cause of the clergy sex abuse cases is outrageous. Based on my experience with countless clergy sex abuse, the depravity of sex abuse in the class in the Catholic Church is born out of a pattern of criminal predation that has nothing to do with clericalism. Rather, the statistics overwhelmingly point to homosexual priests who groom young boys with alcohol, with drugs, with homosexual porn, with guilt and blackmail into the repeated sexual gratification of priests. Sexual gratification, not clericalism, is the motive, the drive, and the criminal pattern. In the United States, eight, over 80% of the predation was priests on male victims. These statistics are irrefutable, and the synodal acceleration and advocacy and imposition of the LGBTQIA agenda and inclusion into the Catholic Church will rapidly increase the dangers of predation, not lessen them. What happened to the lessons of the last 50 years? Francis has learned nothing in the last decade of cascading sexual abuse cases laid 
directly at his feet. With the stroke of his pen, the Rupniks, the McCarricks, and all of his celebrity pals could have been gone, never to have preyed on children or vulnerable adults, never to have been allowed to paint church commissioned artwork, never to have been allowed to conduct a papal supported homily, never to have had access to the confession, and never to have negotiated a disastrous secret deal with the communist Chinese that destroyed the underground Catholic Church. Well, Cardinal Crack said that what emerges from the Synod is a church that reaches out that has created spaces for everyone, making room for everyone so that no one feels excluded, so that no one feels excluded in his or her home. Well, that quote should have been footnoted with the caveat, except for clergy abuse victims. Saying so doesn't make it so. No matter how many times the Synod document states and invokes listening, 40 times, dialogue 28 times, journey 29 times, there exists no mention of the important word, the crucial word essential to root out predation. The failure of this word is intentional, it's strategic, and it's deliberate. That word captures the decade-long predation of clerical abuse. That word encapsulates the ongoing protection racket at the highest level of the church. The word that they don't want to acknowledge. The word that they don't want to dialogue about. That word is evil. You cannot fight an opponent if you do not identify it. Ignoring evil will make it flourish. Suppressing evil will force it to flourish. This is the miserable and scandalous legacy of the Francis papacy. Thank you.